Hello everyone, today we talk about the Sassanid Heavy Cavalry, or uh, Asbaran, as, uh, which is a very generic uh, term, by the way, but it sometimes identifies, or at least chiefly from an etymological point of view, identifies the uh, pair, horse and, and man, but it was attached also to, to, to the infantry, the in military, in the Sassanid military, which is a witness of the importance of cavalry that was conceived this uh, primary um, arm um, <coughs> aside uh, to, to even define uh, every unit of, of the Sassanid army. Um, and this is a topic, this, this is the first video I uh, actually make um, specifically about the Sassanids. I I talked uh, about them, I think, extensively when I made some videos about uh, especially um, Islamic history because of the Persian influence on the Arabs and all. Um, and this is just the first one that instead I decided to dedicate to this um, uh, cavalry unit. Uh, so it's a military history video. Um, and uh, and I don't know. I, I I will definitely progress in in in, in, in discussing this assigned army that I find terribly fascinating. Um, so in this sense, um, I think uh, being the first video on them, I I should make a bit of premise relatively to what we're talking about roughly. First of all, today we are going to discuss about the um, latest uh, Sassanid um, Asbaran. So, uh, the Sassanid dynasty, as you know, probably ro already is, uh, rose uh, from, let's say, the, the ashes of the, the Parthian kingdom with the end of the Arsacid dynasty uh, and um, uh, in, in the first uh, decades of the 3rd century um, AD. Um, I don't remember if it was, I think it was the 30s, like 232 now, I, I don't remember, but uh, those were the years. Um, and these were essentially Persians, you know, the, the Parthians had managed already to, to carve back um, uh, the Persian uh, dominions from the Seleucids during the first centuries BC, uh, and they had grown this um, kind of, uh, I, I can't even say regional power proper, because yeah, they, they could have been, but essentially um, the, the Parthians are famous for, for their engagements against the Romans famously for the, the Roman defeat of Carrai, uh, which um, actually left sometimes in popular culture this stigma as if, you know, the Parthians were this unstoppable force with their um, <coughs> uh, steps tactics that we will see were actually practically the same of the Sassanids. Um, but as a matter of fact, the Parthians, um, although they managed to inflict um, more than one loss um, to the Romans in, in the battle, were actually not really a threat to, to Roman rule um, on the long run into the, the Near East. And even if they tried to, to, to break through the Roman um, defenses, they eventually were always repulsed and were also soundly defeated under Nero, for instance, by Corbulo, but there are also other um, other moments in which this happened. The same, um, the same uh, Sassids basically declined because of the uh, of the campaign that the Romans carried out in the in the second half of the of the second century A.D. Uh, and therefore, uh, opening the way to the Persians. Uh, to the Sassanids, probably, not the Persians, because they were already Persians. But even on the adjective Persian, this is what I said, it, uh, uh, we should focus on what Persian basically meant, because um, even today, uh, Iran I is a pretty um, ethnically complex um, uh, land, and uh, so it was uh, back in the day. Uh, the Persian Empire was uh, the one of the Achaemenid dynasty, the, the one of Cyrus, the one of, 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 the, of Darius, um, and this uh, huge domain of the ancient world that eventually was uh, destroyed, conquered better, and absorbed by Alexander. Um, and, uh, and it was this great um, civilization that really influenced massively even the same uh, successor uh, kingdoms. Um, and that kept being a model from its um, 
um, Persian core to 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 other uh, countries, but really the same uh, Achaemenid dynasty had come from the, uh, the Medians, uh, who were peoples we named it the the uh, the Eurasian steppes. They were uh, Indo-Europeans in practice, and they originally were nomads, uh, and the the, the Parthians uh, actually before settling to Persia were themselves uh, a people uh, dwelling into uh, the, in the eastern side of the part of the Caspian Sea and eventually settling in Iran and intermingling with um, um, the, the local populations um, so um, and, and this happened um, you know in a bit you have to think of Iran as a sort of frontier area I mean the, the Iranian plateau is something pretty pretty big and pretty defined uh, it's, it's, uh, it has also very difficult terrain reason for which Persia has remained in this sense a bit of a of a thing on its own and um, it always kind of allowed um, um, both the um, let's say the sedentarization of the nomads in part but also it retained a kind of feudal character because of the lands of the environment um, in this plateau basically you can keep using uh, a feudal um, society that is similar to the one of the steps and not becoming a, a solidly uh, centralized and bureaucratic uh, state with millions of people like it, it existed in India or in Mesopotamia or in Egypt so <coughs> what had happened at, at, up to that point is that the, um, the, the elites of the steppes that had come to, to, to dwell into Iran eventually had migrated into them were able to replicate in part uh, their ri uh, original, mm, their traditional um, society uh, of warlords that uh, owned certain castles, at least in Iran, they didn't own castles into the steppes, but from there they could perpetrate, perpetuate the, um, the, the building of a sort of a feudal society. And uh, the Sassanids were this lethal um, uh, combination of this, uh, of, first of all, of the deriving from the strengthening of the same feudal society. Because uh, they, uh, differently from the Parthians, they were more sedentarized. So they kind of framed um, the local populations into a, a, a well-structured um, hierarchical system into which um, that, that allowed to replicate feudal uh, to 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 build up a solid feudalism with uh, just a, a very few rich noble guys at the top owning lands and fortresses and and therefore having enough money to to field um, heavy cavalry and very highly trained one. But at the same time, they also learned, uh, w which is something that the Parthians hadn't done, because the Parthians were a bit more like calling our other our, our, uh, subject populations from the Seps and um, still replicating this kind of com confederative political form that existed in the steppe, but not being uh, an extremely solid and effective state. The Sassanids achieved that instead, inspiring, um, being inspired in turn by the Achaemenid model, which was taken once again even in its uh, imperialistic um, uh, instances and, and, and ambitions um, towards the outer world. And one weakness of the Parthians had been an, the, the lack of, um, of, a success, of an effective uh, siege um, uh, engineering. They didn't know much of, of that, like most of the Seps peoples, not even uh, after having settled um, into Iran for, you know, for, 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 long, for a long time. Eventually, it seems that the Sassanids learned from, from the Romans, so from their mm, bitterest enemies, um, the art of, of siege warfare, and therefore becoming much more effective even in, uh, in aggression towards uh, the Roman frontier. Um, so the, Sassanids, uh, the Sassanid Empire configured itself as a very strong, very um, lethal and very threatening um, um, enemy for the Romans uh, with a with a professional army, uh, which uh, heavy cavalry that we analyze today basically represented the, the backbone. So the Sassanids retained their um, the the steps tactics into their feudal system, 
and that was capable of uh, substantial expansion. And even though the Roman Empire was stronger than the Sassanid one, the Sassanid one was relatively more compact. It, uh, it had also its own problems on other frontiers in the sense that eventually uh, Rome and, and, and Persia kind of met similar problems. The, 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 the Russian, uh, oh my god, <laughs> the Russians, wh what, are they, what do they have to do with it now? The Romans, I meant, were, because I was thinking about Russia and the steppes, um, had to, um, to deal with the Black Huns uh, in the West, the, um, the Sassanids had to deal with the White Huns uh, in, in the East. Um, they they had in this sense um, uh, I mean the, R the Roman society Roman and Sassanid societies were quite different but they still met similar threats to which they responded in similar ways also the Sassanids uh, had uh, I, I'd say more traditionally than the Romans this idea of the defense in depth so-called this way because we have this picture that the Romans kind of had borders that had they had to defend. It's a bit more complicated than that, but definitely um, their strategy changed uh, during the migration era, uh, more evidently relatively to the uh, permeability of the um, of the borders in terms, especially of military um, of military external military threats. Um, the Persians did the same, essentially in the the mountains of of the northeast of their domains. Um, um, with fortresses and uh, and all against uh, the, the nomads. Um In this sense, they were closer. I mean, the, the Sassanids were closer to nomadic and nomadic culture. We will be seeing it uh, eventually because m many of their auxiliaries were actually uh, uh, of Iranian stock. Or, or, or Turkish stock. Even the, the Romans used, uh, if you think about the Sarmatians, were of Iranian stock as well. Um, when I say Iranian here, we're not really talking about Iran. It has to be clear. The, the, uh, we're talking essentially about the, the Europeans of the steppes, if we can call them uh, in this fashion, in, this, in, the, in the sense that these were Caucasian populations that dwelled into the Eurasian steppes and in this sense were scattered from the uh, from the uh, Danubian plain to the, the uh, to the Hungarian plain to to Siberia so they um, they met with the several the sedentary powers including China by the way so think about Russia Persia and China and by the way uh, the Rus um, sino Roman relations were actually pretty much influenced by the fact that the Sassanid Empire stood in in the middle because the uh, there was a pretty intense international trade at the time. The Sassanids had this strategic location that could mm, significantly um, uh, absorb part of those trades in 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 uh, uh, to the disadvantage of the Ro of the Romans, who in fact uh, tried to to destroy his power essentially to to let the caravans passing through uh, through it freely. An achievement that had been obtained when Nero or uh, the, the Antonini um, had cr made the the Parthian kingdom uh, crumble. Otherwise, they had to pass through Egypt and from there the Indian Ocean, India, and arriving to China from from the la uh, the the sea route. Mm -hmm. But um, that implied our things. But this is not what we want to talk about today. We just want to talk about the fact that um, the Sassanid society was a, a feudal society and this produced heavy cavalry. As a general rule, you can apply that to to many other um, societies. You can say, oh well, but also the Romans had this. They they managed to replicate the the part of Sassanid cataphracts. Yes, but they sucked. They <laughs> literally because they. They, they were they were of new no use in practice into battle. Uh, the the later cataphracts were more um, effective in, into the Byzantine history, but here we should even talk about. Here I use the for instance the um, the term Asveran now or or Sarvan as I found it elsewhere to define uh, the. Um, these late Sassanid cavalry and that we will be discussing mostly about the 7th century now. 
so very much ahead and uh, at a later stage of development of the Sasan military probably also its most effective for a moment um, because it's not that the Sassanids rose all of a sudden as this um, lethal force like it, it was happening to and even threatening Constantinople eventually in the early Middle Ages but they um, what I was saying is sometimes in, in the sources we find the term cataphract s simply or clibanarius now the terminological problems are uh, endless uh, simply because um, these were cataphract and clibanarius were kind of inter interchangeable names that by the way were used by uh, the classical authors to define uh, these essentially armored um, troops, um, uh, armored cavalry, um, cataphracts seemingly having be a, a bit of more of a generic uh, name, with uh, basically that c could be attributed to every form of cavalry that had uh, uh, iron somewhere, <laughs> uh, even if in, in smaller in smaller parts. Um, seemingly the the clibanarius, but the, the cataphract could also well equate to the full armored cataphract. Well, Clibanarius seems to have had a um, more el elitary meaning, but it's, this is just a bit of a semantic differentiation that um, is not categorical. Like, we modern have the, 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 the childish obsession to lead every kind of uh, past historical notion to our way of thinking. These guys didn't use categories in the um, scientific way we do it, in the encyclopedic way we do that from the encyclopedie in the 18th century. Um, these terms were much more malleable in many ways and it, it doesn't even make sense to say oh yeah that, that they, they, they do correspond to a scientific category that can be uh, clearly interpreted. No, these authors didn't intend that in that way. So we have even to, to deal with the fact that certain things cannot be known simply. Um, so uh, now we're talking essentially about Sassanid cavalry and its heavier, um, uh, its elite that was definitely a, a heavy elite, partly cursed as you see here, here in this beautiful, beautiful drawing that I, that I chose for you. And that as we will see, it's it's, it's a bit atypical uh, in the sense that um, this is in uh, this is um, a huge statue that is present in in the Tak uh, i Bustan Grotto, um, dedicated to the Persian Emperor Khosrow II, the one that uh, basically uh, threatened the most the the Byzantine territories. Um, and that uh, therefore represents the, the terminal stage of the Sassanids even because um, the eventually they were defeated in 628 at Nineveh famously by Heraclius and, um, and, the, and the Sassanid Empire collapsed essentially after that. Um, but they, they represent uh, also a very elite uh, form of cavalry that um, also own certain characteristics in terms of the armor style and all that were not extremely common but they, they it's, it's still a very good exemplar of of Sassanid heavy cavalry. Um, so what were these guys essentially? Well um, as I was saying before these were uh, warrior nobles mm. in practice that were um, really divided uh, in two various groups into Sasanian society because part of them dwell, belonged to the, actually the original Sasanid clan uh, we can say. Uh, Iran in this sense you have to think of a feudal society being really feudal also in this meaning that there were many other families that eventually rose to power and that could feel this elite cavalry. Um, uh, there is this idea that the Sassanids wanted to mm, to stress the Aryan heritage of their own nobility, so this is a long tradition that we should, I, I should really make um, 
another video just on that. But just to make the long story short, basically, these steps invaders uh, sometimes had this, um, especially the Indo-European ones, uh, this idea that basically as warriors they had to rule as superiors those who had conquered. This happened in Vedic India, this happened partly also in this uh, Persian um, uh, in, in, in Persian culture. But the reality as always was multi-ethnic. Um, so there were other groups, uh, ethnic groups that had been integrated, always coming from the steppes indeed, in part, but also probably mm, eventually blending with part of the local uh, pre-party -pre and pre-Sassanid aristocracy uh, that had also consistent power and therefore territories, feudal estates um, scattered um, or maybe concentrated in certain parts of the of the Iranian plateau. And these were really the elite in a feudal society. It means that there are tons of, <laughs> we can't say, of, of people who basically work for you to have such an extremely, extremely, extremely expensive uh, equipment like this. Like already the, the knight that we can definitely call this way because these were knights just like the ones that in feudal Europe would have developed. Um, um, uh, already the knight gear as an individual was um, extremely expensive. Then you see here a, a beautiful lamellar um, uh, armor uh, for the horse. Uh, this is an elf armored horse as you can see. Uh, it was uh, something that only the elite could uh, could afford, mm -hmm. um, and uh, the um, and 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 they had to afford not just the equipment but also the retainers, mm -hmm. more than one horse definitely because during the fights, uh, but also simply for moving um, uh, on strategical theaters, you needed more than definitely more more than one horse. Uh, you had to need retainers that were often also mounted, uh, who, who brought your weapons and uh, assisted you into battle. They helped you uh, wearing up your armor and all. Um, and, um, and and in this sense, um, also following of, of of other elements that uh, substantially. Um, create also a tactical ensemble in, in certain um, situations because esquires can also support their masters definitely and um, and these were definitely professionals mm? they were people who uh, spent their whole lives uh, training uh, since the uh, Achaemenid times Persian nobility had been constantly trained into fighting and especially into fighting with uh, with every kind of weapon, as horsemen, um, with uh, bow and arrow, that was the kind of a bit the, the symbol of the steps, uh, but also obviously the the lance, uh, axes, swords. And, I mean, every kind of weapon really um, that made makes you understand how highly trained these these people were. And what makes feudalism so great is that your professionals have also a very high degree of collective training because um, there are clienterly bonds between the, uh, within the aristocracy that basically allow us then to train together, to play in games, to exercise, and therefore to be able to fight in formation. That is what basically makes you effective on the battlefield. If you can be the best individual fighter of the world with a best equipment of the world, but if you fight alone, instead of information, you're... Uh, I was <laughs> about to say a bad word, but I, I won't say that, but I think you understand uh, what the fate of individuals <laughs> at that point as single-minded uh, people, too, because this uh, would have been... Um, you ha and, and, and it's not easy really to transform warriors originally coming from the steps into well-trained um, disciplined troops, but telling you through the steps um, already by themselves because of this constant threat that arrives from everywhere kind of already um, 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 get um, these warriors habituated to, to, to fight into, into collective formations. You, you see these swarms of, 
of um, of steps people's fighting being on horseback and going back and forth they, they already knew what what what, what their um this uh, what, what their tactics had to be because there was no other way uh, to to even think of war in that sense the societies uh, have partly lost this they have more sedentarized but in this sense they have also developed um a kind of different um uh way of of dealing uh, you know different relatively different tactics that on the surface seem practically identical of the one of the steps but that in a in a sedentary society are a bit of something different and we will discuss this uh, right now because there is an important point to make um the um um it 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 seems that uh now etymologies can be nice uh, to to learn uh, there were um relatively to uh, clibanarius there are various etymologies uh, one of them that that basically they were ovens as if you know being all covered into um into iron they they kind of cooked themselves under the sun under them but this is just an interpretation the other is more um linguistical and it basically wants the 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 classical term deriving from the persian grief panvar uh which literally me should mean at least i i i trust here my translation i don't know farsi i don't know persian but it should be neck guard wearer mm? so not at all differently from the european term hauberk that uh, derives from alsberg uh, that is neck protection and this is because the um uh, here uh, you can't see it uh, there is a sort of kamai hmm? so this male also covering your face um, and sometimes uh, here you don't see it but um, there could be a, a sort of collar that protected your neck like a, a plate armor around your neck and um and you have to think of this being extremely important because aside from arrows that really flew uh, everywhere into the steps context and among the persians um there was also and we have uh, a massive um, iconographical evidence of this of of um of of persian knights uh, actually charging into each other with this uh, spear that you see uh, therefore, if you have a plate armor on your or your neck, I think <laughs> if a lance arrives uh, at your neck, it's better if you are wearing it. Um, and uh, but there were obviously various styles, various um, types of armor in practice. Uh, not really types, but various adjustments, various um, uh, parts of your gear that you could personalize, customize in has as you. Uh, as you uh, can imagine um the uh and we have a pretty a relatively good uh i mean persia is not really a place we know everything about because feudal societies tend not to be extremely um telling about them themselves usually uh, we know much more about Rome uh, and or Greece than, than Persia uh, and its society simply because being a more stratified society there, there are less middle classes actually writing on their own and everything is a bit more framed into the um, into the hierarchical perspective the elite which is highly ideal by the way the, the, the society's words are Austrian they were developing all a sort of, th of uh, theological vision of the world. Um, at this point, like at the beginning of the 7th century, not much differently from the Romans that were at that point really crystallizing their uh, culture and society on a, in a Christian fashion with, uh, with a very strong relation with um, between church and state. Um, and, and, and in this sense, uh, the clash, the last clash between the Byzantines and the Sassanids was pretty much also a kind of a clash of identity also in terms of uh, Christianism versus Zoroastrianism and this in turn heavily influenced um, Islam which was about to rise at that point uh, essentially on the ashes of these uh, empires especially the, per the Persian one because eventually the, the Romans made it to, 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 to halt the Arabs uh, while Persia was uh, had just been defeated by the Byzantines um, 
but in turn was so influential that it, it, it it's more the Arabs that got Persianized than than the Persians Arabicide, and even uh, the local religious traditions of Persia were remained quite particular. Sh um, Shiism was, uh, in this sense, has um, um, certain exoteric characters that uh, kind of um, met up with uh, Zoroastrianism. The the Islamic Caliphate was heavily influenced by Persian tradition and all, and Persia remained kind of something on its own, also because of the difficult terrain, the the the, the routing of the feudal society, so of the same Persians that although defeated as a state, because at this time the, the Sassanids had also their, uh, they ruled also over Mesopotamia, so the, 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 the capital was Ctesiphon, that was destroyed by the Romans, um, that had already been, by the way, um, and, um, and, and that equated to rule uh, a great wealthy land, one of Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia, incidentally the one into which the Abbasid Caliphate would have dwelt from Baghdad. But in this sense the Persian lords of, of the mount, of the, the Iranian plateau, remained who they were in practice. There was not mm, substantially a substitution uh, of, um, with the Arab elites like, like it could happen in the, um, in the formerly Roman territories that had a, a more centralized structure. And uh, we are, how I was saying, uh, relatively well de uh, informed about mm, the equipment uh, of of these um, um, of these knights, uh, simply because we uh, we first of all we have a lot of the iconographical sources, like mostly rock reliefs, which is not, you know, uh, the best, but it, it is also a great thing. And by the way, the um, uh, the 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 Groot of um, of uh, Taki Bustan the, uh, the 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 Grot of Taki Bustan is a, a beautiful thing. If you have a now and I think I will post a picture of that. But go check that out. It's fantastic. I, I would love to visit Iran uh, in general because I think Persian culture is amazing, historically speaking. Um, but we also have a list of regulation of, um, equipment hmm, from the reign of, Co of the Sassanid Emperor um, Khosrows the First, who is um, thought to have been the uh, the, the greatest um, Sassanian um, ruler in the sense that he he developed a lot of. Um, uh, he carried out a lot of reforms, especially in taxation, which always helps to rationalize military expenses. Um, and and uh, it, it's a moment, he was contemporary of Justinian, just to make you understand, those were the big guys at the time. Um, and um, and there was also seemingly a kind of middle class rising from the base that eventually helped developing a Sassanid bureaucracy that was uh, relatively well off at the time and, and, and that was backed by the uh, the king in this sense so it, it was it wasn't a fully feudal society it was also something more unavoidably considering all the, the amount of um, cultural influences and and diverse ter um, cultures that existed in and communities that existed into the Sassanid Empire that was immense if you really look at uh, I look at on a map. The, this time, the, the the Sassanids stretch up to Yemen, uh, to to uh, to India. You know, they, they they really have a big influence all over Mesopotamia and the Iranian plateau and beyond. Even on Caucasus. That mm, I will have to talk about the Sassanids. I know that <laughs> more in the future. So learn um, and we also have certain uh, later Arab sources like Tabari that. Tell us about the Sassanids, and this is uh, also very interesting because there is also a, a big deal of kind of understanding what the Arabs eventually narrated about of this equestrian tradition of Persia, um, and we don't know much about that. So, but going back to the uh, the, uh, the equipment regulations. Um, here, there is, here it's um, the least that we have um, for parade, 
Mm -hmm. Then we will discuss a little bit about the actual bow use because it, it implies certain uh, I mean it entails certain implications that are important from a tactical point of view. So the, the equipment of these um, Sassanid Asveran was at the time, in the 6th century, a uh, male, a uh, breastplate, helmet, greaves, lance, shield, sword, mace, axe, axe sorry, quiver, with 30 arrows, bow case with two bows and two spy a spare bow strings and horse armor. Now it's um, the mm, we know then eventually from other sources that even van brasses like the one you see here in the in this beautiful picture are actually worn. Here you, you don't see um, you don't see greaves as well as you don't see foot armor that however was definitely used also by uh, the Persian and we know that from reliefs so these were sometimes even much heavier calibermen than what you see here um, and um, the the question is you know of this list was what could really be carried into battle because this is an hell of of things. I mean, male, okay, we we know that. Obviously, there, there was certain, like a sort of um, um, gamson under the, the 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 armor to absorb other other to absorb the hits. Uh, then a breastplate. Uh, here you don't see that, but usually the um, the breastplate was worn uh, either over the male uh, on the torso or underneath it. Mm -hmm. um, the um, so it, it wasn't it would have been something so strange after all uh, to to think that this one here is wearing it under the mail if even if I don't know if the author of this drawing was actually thinking about it and uh, this plate was usually a chest plate so uh, it's always better to protect your your chest <laughs> into battle good hits can really uh, be lethal in there um, and uh, it seems that um, this was um, this chest plate was strapped with um, with straps that were crossed at the back and held um, through a clasp on uh, in the front uh, at least this seems to have been a commonly spread um, uh, method for securing the breastplate, not just in the Sassanid army, but also in others. Um, but it wasn't definitely the only one. As we were saying, it was it, it, the whole thing here is it, it, there was no standardization of sort in practice. Uh, this list is just a prescription that tells you what pieces you have to to wear, but not really what um, what kind. Uh, and it, it, it practically didn't matter as long as you already had them, which was already a big thing in terms of expense. Then helmet, okay, greaves, okay, that start adding also a bit of weight, and as well as uh, vambraces. Then lance, okay, shield, okay, sword, okay. Then mace and axe. Now it, it was definitely, I mean, there is nothing really. Uh, um, too bad in it, in the sense that having um, a secondary weapon, uh, aside from even the sword, like uh, medieval knights usually used um, like daggers, but they could also use maces and axes. But you know, once that you have a mace, I is really an axe necessary at that point? Together with that, uh, yes. Uh, I think so. The only problem it is that it adds on weight, and uh, if you also have to uh, take a quiver, as, as you see it right now, with 30 arrows, which are not very uh, uh, light, and two bows, and uh, okay, the two spare bow strings won't weigh much, and horse armor, but it's a really heavy weight. Consider that these guys, seemingly up to the very end of of the uh, Sasanian times, didn't uh, use, didn't make use of syrups. They had kind of um, uh, wood um, saddles. The word is kind of um, uh, they were already heavy on their own. So think all all in here, the the horse uh, underneath, <laughs> like 
uh, with all this weight on it. Uh, it's not really going to be happy. And this implies something very important, that this cavalry was uh, extremely heavy. Now, the real problem here, as an implication, is that um, what's the role of um, bows and arrows? Because many people here said, well, you know what, they, they used both. Like, this cavalry could become heavy, I mean, could be at the same time heavy, and also skirmishing with bows and arrow. Hmm, do you really think so? I mean, uh, in absolute terms, we have evidence of um, a kind of perfectly multitask cavalry that could achieve uh, both things. Um, but it's rare. And this was something that I, I, I'm just speculating a bit here, but it, it was probably something that existed more in the steppes than in sedentary society, in, in the Sassanid Persia. Um, because the sedentary society um, just tends to make soldiers heavier because they uh, usually sedentary society is uh, wealthier especially when you have such a stratified one with, with a guy at the top that can really be equipped with the best of equipment. The steppes have something similar with a very narrow elite of troops that usually were made up of the uh, by the aristocracy of the leading uh, tribe that in the confederation with the, with the other client tribes really being more sort of masses of uh, unarmored uh, horse archers. Uh, so it, it it was possible to combine with maybe with certain lighter um, materials, uh, sort of, uh, of 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 a combination of, of a sort of defense for like armor, but maybe with of organic material, and uh, being capable of charging with the lance, like a sort of medium cavalry, and and at the same time using the bow. But uh, I think personally that when the Sassanid cavalry uh, of this time was already a pretty sedentary one in practice, in spite of the all this the cultural uh, influence of the steppes, there was a functional and very sharp division between light cavalry and heavy cavalry, which means that light cavalry uh, was were used as horse archers, heavy cavalry was used as thickly packed. Um, formations into of, of, of spearmen that had just to charge and not to waste time and energies especially um, f um, eventually acting also as uh, bowmen to do that usually did in this sense this the famous parting tactics of, of back and forth shooting arrows in continuation against the enemy um, and this simply because um, a horse and even a knight that are so heavily loaded in weight you know, they're kind of a loss, uh, like kind of a waste if used as uh, uh, horse archers. Which which doesn't mean they, they didn't know how to use the bow. And I am personally convinced that probably the bow in that sense was, was present there. But um, much less than we think, because even arrows uh, add extra weight, they, they, you have to keep balance with them you know, you have to charge eventually, so while overloading yourself with something that create, complicates the situation and that doesn't even fit uh, into your dominant, uh, for your dominant heavy cavalry role, if there are other guys who sometimes even completely unarmored with much lighter uh, and better oxygenating horses can just do back and forth and uh, for you, and then opening the path for your uh, heavy cavalry charge when the enemy is already well softened up. Um, so the the idea is that these knights definitely knew how to use bows. You know, uh, they they spent their whole time hunting on horseback. Um, so they normally would use it. Uh, obviously, they wouldn't hunt with the wall battle uh, armor on. Uh, but they knew how to use that. It's it's a bit like why uh, you know like in, in with the Normans uh, that came a bit later, of course, and were in another place. Um, but you know all this idea of the problem of where the Normans killed bowmen. Of course they were. <laughs> of course they were. They all were. The problem is just that when they came on 
um, uh, to, to, to act as heavy cavalrymen, they wouldn't waste time using uh, the bow. They would simply concentrate on being heavy cavalrymen for shock actions with cavalry charges and stuff like that. Uh, and and having and throwing maybe just heavier things than bow uh, than arrows like javelins and, or, or even their own lances that practically were the same thing uh, to a certain point. So the idea is um, these guys were skilled definitely in using all these weapons: maces, axes, and all swords, uh, bows, and arrows. But simply in battle, there are certain logics that really tend you to to really differentiate the roles for a more effective um, functionality. And and this happens obviously because the individual Sasanian knight was probably a very cocky, arrogant type like all the, the like the Western cavalry feudal elite eventually that uh, boasted incredible uh, s uh, individual skills by using all these weapons. But as I was saying before, when it came to, to fight uh, for real, it was really the formation that, count, count, and the, that counted. It was training, it was sticking together, it was maneuvering if effectively as one formation. And in that sense, all you need is to know how to charge well, not to waste time shooting with a bow. Also because we all know uh, in every history that elite cavalry is shock cavalry point. Um, it doesn't do things that every skirmisher can, can, can easily and even more effectively do. So this is a very important point in my opinion. So maybe on a parade like in, in, in the um like the one uh we have read here uh, in the list, you could wear all these weapons, definitely. Uh but probably um uh, in battle this didn't happen. You could definitely call carry a lance, shield, a sword, even a mace. The mace is very inch and the axe also is very interesting because it tells you that probably there was also a lot of infighting between armored units into Sassanid Persia themselves, like the same uh, knights. And maces and axes are blunt weapons, so they, they, they're they, they, they have to do trauma under the armor. Every time you, you see in an archaeological context a mace, just know that that is needed for breaking armor. So. Uh, if you if you are wondering, you know if uh, uh, if, if you know th th if a knight is armored with uh, is equipped with a with a with a mace, it's because he has to break someone else's armor. Usually, another knight, <laughs> I'd say, um, seems pretty much um, obvious. Mm. Um, so the um, and and there were actually quite um, um, sometimes we don't really obviously this was. Um, this uh, Asvaran uh, uh, cavalry was a pretty um, varied one. It would be light cavalry men as heavy ones. So here we're really talking about the elite of the Asvaran that were probably made up of uh, of a few um, of a few um, uh, hundreds cavalry, heavy cavalry, or maybe up to um, some some thousands. We actually have knowledge of the uh, the most famous sovereign uh, units uh, were the um, Zayadan, the so-called immortals that uh, echoed the the, the, the Achaemenid immortals um, of of ancient Persia, and we know that they number ten thousand men. Mm -hmm. um, the um, so. Uh, this was even probably um, um, w was it considered um, a sort of s of spearhead of the Sassanid army. Even na the number of ten thousand implies that probably these weren't at all all armored. Then we have evidence also of um, the uh, uh, the imperial bodyguard under Khosrow. Uh, the uh, the second with the um, uh, with the so-called uh, Pushtik Ban, I believe, the imperial bodyguard hmm, that counted six thousand strong under Khosrow the second. Uh, uh, so between the 
at the end of the sixth and beginning of the seventh century, so really the times this this drawing is is really about. Also in here we can yeah, we can think maybe at this point they could have been all armored in some fashion. Uh, which is uh, definitely interesting, um, and uh, we um, we um, uh, sorry, I I think I made a mistake. Uh, just m let me look. Uh, no, I don't think so. But uh, ah, yeah. Yeah, I think maybe the terms here do not hold. Let's say that the Imperial Bodyguard had a um, um, another su subunit or an elite in turn, which suggests also the fact that there was uh, a certification and different level of of equipment. Uh, here I find it right, uh, written as Gyan uh, Navspar. Um, and uh, yeah, v uh, yeah, no, 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 it was everything was right. I mean, we we I, I was simply reflecting on the numbers in the sense that we know that under Cosro, the Imperial Bodyguard counted six thousand, but there was an elite. Mm -hmm. There was in fact this Gian Avspar, who are um, basically uh, the, the this name means those who sacrifice their lives and. This is uh, the same name from which the uh, the Peshmerga forces in in the uh, Iranian military still today take their name from. So you see even how tradition is. It's as if uh, I don't know Italy today had a, a body of of, uh, of Praetorians <laughs> uh, still in their army, and the Peshmerga basically um, come uh, from 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 this sense. I mean, there they were. Uh, they're an elite. Um, at the time, this Gian Avspar was evidently meant to to be really the cream of the um, of the Sasanian army, and you could definitely find a uh, cavalryman like this one depicted here um, as effective um, as the, the way it looks in here. Um, relatively to um, to the um to the horses because um this is also interesting i'm not specifically talking about the horses today but it's still very important it seems that obviously this heavy cavalry needed heavy uh, heavy horses and uh we know that uh, even since parton times uh, the uh, the the heavy mm, you know the heavy cavalry had very big breeds very large, solid horses that could, that um, seemingly looked as if they were almost like elephants. The, the ancient sources say, um, because they had they had to be very mu muscular. They had to, to support the um, all this weight, but at the same time they were less uh, speedy, as always. Like just if you if you see uh, in, into feudal Europe, you know, the heaviest stallions were used, but they, they those were for for mass, but they they didn't uh, practically uh, almost never charged in full gallop because they simply didn't make it with all the weight of the armor of of the of the knight over them. Uh, so they were quite imposant um, animals. Um, the um, uh, obviously light cavalry close to the um, to, to these heavier knights did definitely exist. Um, but uh, definitely these ones needed bigger horses mm -hmm. and this reinforces also the, the tactical differentiation mm -hmm, of the heavy cavalry and the skirmishing ones and, and relatively to this um, I wanted to add before I, I forget that between the late 6th and the uh, early 8th centuries definitely the um, the um, the, the, the Sassanids made uh, a vast use also of populations that were uh, pushing at the frontiers like uh, the the white Huns and uh, and the Turks, um, the um, the white Huns really in the early sixth century and the Turks from the late sixth and early seventh um, that were usually lighter 
mm, as uh, subject like as as mercenaries or maybe client tribes they they were mostly taken in in block so with all the effectives and uh, therefore with a higher proportion of light um lighter infantry and this is very important because it also shows you that the heavier cavalry uh was in this sense um probably be better um um you know th the Sassanids were had a probably even a heavier and more effective cavalry than um than than parts of some of the steps uh, uh at least or at least they wanted to m to maintain preeminence in in that in their armies while um uh, most of uh, the uh the lighter cavalry uh and was a pretty good um and uh, well um uh, well uh, i don't know how to say that well trained and uh, more expandable in, in in its own fashion because that's the one you you're going to have more losses in um uh in uh if you've taken for from auxiliaries like the asiatic ones that we have mentioned um the uh the equipment of the horses here i mean usually the Parthians and the Sassanids in their uh armored cavalry uh initially used um um like um um uh i don't know how to say it the uh squames or a scale armor, yes, uh, with all these little uh, scales in place together. Here, instead, it seems that, or maybe something uh, more, uh, usually it was in iron or bronze, um, but sometimes you could find even felter or other organic material like horn uh, or even, even leather in some measures. Um, here instead it seems that f in the late Sassanid times the armor, horse armor, uh, started being of, made up of lamelle mm -hmm. that are on average more, resi more resistant, so, and, and that is possibly associated with, with a greater increase in, in cavalry warfare, in, uh, even in the same, um, sheer, uh, dimension of troops used and their, um um uh, and their um and, and even the obviously the 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 uh, combat with with other uh steps uh, uh steps uh calories that exist in the two region that were pressing at the also the Sassanian borders just like in the Roman ones. Uh also in the Byzantine Empire there is a kind of rely um, in the same times uh a growing reliance on the um um on uh, on uh, on cavalry compared to to previous times and and this would open basically even to uh kind of medieval warfare into which cavalry remained uh or began began to remain uh, preeminent if not um and uh if not sometimes the, the core unit of of the armies definitely the Senate armies the, the cavalry heavy cavalry was um a core unit uh, the, the backbone, really. Uh, another interesting thing here, I don't know if you look at that, um, here there is a beautiful van brace that is being worn by the knights, which definitely corresponds to the need of protection of during the chart, because the, the arm is exposed. Uh, but here you see even shields um, that are... Um, uh, th here maybe it's not very well showed, but I, I believe this small shield is gonna, a circle one is gonna represent, uh, uh, it has a sun motive that is the, um, it's part of the solar symbolism that existed both in Mithraism and in Zoroastrian, Zoroastrianism. So the, some of the various, um, um, many manifestations of the greater divinity mm, uh, and that uh, appeared prominently pr prominently into the um, as symbols into the Sasanian military mm. uh, you have to think a, a great choreographed and symbolic highly symbolical um, um, uh, even appearance in into this sense uh, on the battlefields to intimidate the enemy and and all so I think I actually said everything I wanted to say 
I don't know how much I shed light on these units. I just think um, they're very interesting as a late Sasanian uh, heavy cavalry. These were troops that made history on the battlefields. Um, and that were really the fear of, um, uh, of, of many peoples, including the Romans, that even if they had their own heavy cavalry and even a copy of the uh, Eastern Cataphract in some fashion never actually achieved to have feudal society as such, maybe just with the Pernoyer system, but it was still something very different. The Romans remaining fully sedentary, the Sassanids being still part of, of that steppes world that that excelled into uh, into um, cavalry warfare as as it was proved. Uh, and uh, okay, so for now just um, Hope that you liked this video, if you did please share it, otherwise just leave a like or subscribe to my channel to receive further um, notifications about my um, my contents, uh, my, by, my, about my new contents, and as always I thank you heartily for listening to me, I wish you a nice time, and see you next time. Bye!